Well, welcome um, <clears throat> everyone to uh, first in a series of uh, discussion forums, we're gonna call these, uh, put together by the Cyto Innovation Team. So we're coming up on 10 years since the inaugural Cyto Innovation event in, at the Cyto meeting in Leipzig, Germany, back in, I think it was 2012. Um, there we had um, a couple of interesting talks by Wolfgang Goethe and uh, Dieter Rechtenwald, um, and we had our first technology showcase, um, and it was a great success and has developed to be, you know, a favorite uh, part of the CITO program, including this year at CITO Innovation, or at CITO vir at Virtual CITO. Um, you know, one of the one of the real advantages of the person-to-person -person meeting is, you know, the ability to chat with people and you know, catch up. Um, and so as we thought about what we would do as far as uh, develop, continuing to develop the site innovation program, um, you know, the notion of discussion forums and webinars coming up uh, ever more important in our lives these days. Um, and so this is our attempt to um, have some discussion amongst the uh, innovation community within ISAC. Um, and so for today's uh, forum, we have uh, two uh, innovators. Um, we have Kirk Mutafopoulos, who is one of the new ISAC entrepreneurial innovators, which is a new leadership development program that uh, ISAC uh, launched this year. Um, and we also have Gary Durek, who's a longtime ISAC member and force in the field of flow cytometry. Um, and so today we're going to uh, let Kirk uh, pick Gary's brains about what he's learned in his uh, journey uh, through industry and academics and entrepreneurship. Um, so Kirk, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, John. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, as John said, uh, today um, we're going to host uh, Gary Dirac, and he's going to tell us um, about his experience as an innovator and an entrepreneur in the flow cytometry field. And um, I think for the sake of time, since we have an hour, I'll just uh, get right uh, started to it. Um, we'll try to pause at some point for questions, um, and we will leave a good, hopefully, 20 to 30 minutes um, towards the end. Um, for folks to um, submit uh, submit questions and um, for me to then field the questions to Gary. And we also have a Slack channel that was set up um, that most, I think everyone at least here is probably was invited to it, um, where you can also send in some questions as well post the um, this event. So I'll get right started. So Gary, thank you again for the time uh, for, for doing this, really appreciate it. Um, so. I guess the first question is, you know, how did you get involved in cytometry and what experiences led up to you deciding to start your own business in this field? Yeah, well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Kirk, and I appreciate uh, the chance to talk today and uh, and do welcome open discussion. I, I got into cytometry, I'm old, I got into cytometry in about 1979 uh, with the Coulter Corporation, and that was very early on in their uh, uh, developing some instrumentation and uh, putting it into Eli Lilly with George Boder who at that time was a scientist there. And uh, they, uh, he, he wanted to have an engineer local to, to take care of the thing. And so I was hired and we spent uh, a few years kind of redesigning and remaking that early, early Coulter machine. So uh, that was kind of the first 11 years of my career was, was Coulter and, and uh, the early Epix machines and uh, bringing the Epix Elite out and, and then later the, uh, the Epix MCL and so forth, the XL machines. Um, then, then there was the period with with Purdue University with Paul Robinson and, and Steve Kelly and Kathy Rajem and helping to get that rolling. And uh, I spent a few years there and then moved from there over to the University of Illinois to be the uh, the core facility director for the cytometry core at the University of Illinois, uh, following Julie Auger uh, over there. And we did a number of engineering projects, did some development projects, but like uh, anybody working in the university, I needed extra money for my family. So I started a consulting business uh, on the side uh, while at the university and, uh, and it, it, it did reasonably well. So I was full time uh, in the University of Illinois and I had a consulting business that, that uh, began uh, doing software uh, to connect uh, the, the early clinical flow cytometers to the hospital information systems. And so I did a lot of SQL databases and, and communication software for them. 
And then I began to get several projects from the major flow cytometry companies at that time, uh, Coulter, Beckton Dickinson, Cytomation uh, at that time, uh, who would send me small projects to often fix things that weren't quite working, working right in their equipment. And so we were kind of a fix it uh, little team there in Champaign. Uh, and so that's how I really, you know, my background of, is I, I'm an electrical engineer by training. I, I, I came into the field uh, that way. Uh, and, uh, and, and I started my first company really as to, 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 to augment the, uh, the, the, the compensation offered in academia uh, in, in the core facility direction. And, and it was very interesting and work, worked, out, worked out very well uh, as far as that goes. So that's how, that's how I got into it to begin with. I see. And so what then led you to start creating a, a self-sorting machine, a company for, for self-sorting? Yeah, that that's that was you know like many things that happen in, in, in life. You have things that uh, serendipity, I guess. And and uh, somebody came along one day, and the somebody was the Monsanto Corporation, and they said we're looking for someone that could build uh, automated cell sorting uh, devices in order to sort uh, uh, bull semen for the artificial insemination in the dairy industry. Uh, at that time, XY Corporation was doing some things in that arena, so I was asked to. Could, could we develop technology that would be an alternative to what XY Corporation was doing so that Monsanto could enter that market? And so that, that put me in a situation of having a, an excellent contract opportunity, but it, it then I had to make the decision of, do I stay in the university or leave the university at that time? Because that was no longer a part-time, that was gonna be a full-time gig to do that. And that, while it was a, a, a contract from a company, I'd say it's not dissimilar than to uh, somebody getting a, a significant SBIR grant, say a phase two SBIR, where you have to make possibly make a decision, do I want to stay uh, in a university setting uh, or am I going to quit my job there and go full time into entrepreneurship because you really can't do both. You can't, you try to serve two masters like that, you, you, you just, you're not going to do well probably in either place. And so that's really the crux of, of when I went in to do the Monsanto project and formed what was the beginning of EyeSight at that time uh, out of the consulting company, converted that into EyeSight. And I remember the, the conversations with my wife of, you know, leaving this very safe state funded full time position with great benefits at the University of Illinois. And she said, so what about health insurance? I'm like, well, <laughs> we're going to figure that out, you know, and, and well, how long is this going to last? Well, we've got money for about 18 months. And so it's like, uh, but 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 did make the decision to to go ahead and jump in in that direction and to go full time into the company and that was about 2001. Okay. So so with with Monsanto in the picture, it sounded like that sort of identified what your goals for this company was going to be, and it sounded like you maybe didn't need to raise as much money or much as capital because you had this, as you call it, like an SBIR grant. Yeah, it, um, it, it, it is. It's kind of a non-dilutive funding way to start a company, which most device companies, if you're starting a technology or device company that like like doing this flow cytometry uh, operation, it's going to take millions of dollars to go from, from zero to, to the end. Um, it, it's going to be very difficult to do only with venture capital. Uh, it's very helpful to start with non-dilutive funding, and this provided an opportunity. Now, when, when I set the, the project up with them, uh, because my interest was not in sorting bull semen. Uh, I mean, I knew about it. I'd actually visited Larry Johnson some who had uh, developed the patents at the USDA. So I knew about the technology. My interest was actually to address uh, stem cell sorting and, and, and uh, higher, higher throughput sorting for the research arena and, and other issues with, with uh, normal research and clinical cell sorting. Uh, but the deal that we made was this, is that we would develop all of this technology and automation for, for Monsanto uh, to solve their problem. And then we built machines that had to meet certain specifications and, and we had kind of a runoff against specs. Uh, and as long as we did that, we met the milestones and everything worked, then Monsanto would get all the intellectual property. They would pay all the lawyer fees for perfecting the IP. Monsanto got all the intellectual property for using in the bull semen direction. And I would get all the intellectual property to commercialize for anything else, which was what I really was, was interested in doing. And so really, the, because I knew it was going to take a lot of time, it would have only been worth it to me to, to do that, because what am I going to do after when I get done? So we basically earned our intellectual property position by completing the project for Monsanto in a co-development way that set us up then to move forward to, to, uh, to build uh, devices and instrumentation to go into the general flow cytometry market. And, and so it is a you know it's a situation. Uh, often people would start a company, they would already have 
Uh, maybe there's a certain patent or a certain invention from the university they're bringing out to commercialize. Um, you know, I had a number of my own ideas and things that we, we later brought into patents, but the main IP generation for, for the company we were creating at that time was actually through the development of this, uh, this automated uh, set of equipment for Monsanto, which, which ended up being like a 16 channel cell sorter that, that would run in an automated fashion for, uh, for, for sorting bull semen. So I was, that was really how we, we started, how, how we got the company going, how we raised our initial capital. We did, I don't know, probably a half a million dollars or so of, uh, of investment from, uh, from uh, some, some venture investment early on to, to help round out other things we're doing in the company. Uh, some, some people may have seen the light laser, LYT laser we put out. It was a, one of the early blue lasers we put out of the company at that time. But that was kind of in that phase uh, before we began to move into to then building the research instrumentation. Thank you for, for answering that. Um, does, uh, I'm not getting any fielded questions, so I'm going to keep moving on. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, as, as many of us know uh, and we're aware of, at some point there was a pivot for EyeSight um, that led to Sony. So it sounded like you had an exit strategy for eyesight where you wanted to go into, as you mentioned, the stem cell, the, the mammalian cell sorting field that mm -hmm. wasn't a full semen. Um, so, uh, you know, why the decision for that? Did you know there was a market for that? And, and kind of how did that yeah. you know, path lead you then to Sony? Yeah, when I, and I want to kind of back up a little bit because this is, this is entrepreneurial and people listening to what's going on. And so if there's one thing I really learned through the, the process here is nothing works out the way you expect it to. And so uh, along the path between here and then becoming Sony Biotechnology, uh, well, the first, we had a number of disappointments, uh, a number of things that had gone wrong. And, and I guess if you, you look at my career and you wanted to ask my advice in entrepreneurship, I'd say I may be able to offer some because I think I've, I've made about every mistake that can be made. And I've faced a number of challenges where things go wrong. And one of, one of the first ones was we did this big project for Monsanto, finished it up. We earned all of our IP rights and Monsanto was going to place an order for like several hundred cell sorters that my company was going to build. And so I, in fact, planned to completely finance uh, then the next phase of the company from the profits from building all these these cell sorters. Uh, and and so we we had been negotiating a, project, a contract for months, and if we were a few days away from signing when the board of directors at Monsanto decided that their uh, at that time that their roundup profits were so good that they didn't want to risk uh, being in the animal business at all because that was making, that was giving them too much exposure, uh, uh, possibly to the, you know, the kind of the green movement at that time. So they made a strategic decision to get completely out of animal ag of which my new contract was going to be part of, which left us like, you know, what on, on a Monday, you know, we, we had this, this huge contract that was going to be everything we needed to carry the company the next two years to Friday, we're broke. We have nothing, you know, I mean, I mean, we had money in the bank, but I mean, we had no cash, no capital to, to do the thing that we planned to do over the next next several months. And so that was one of the first things is we, you know, like, oh, you know, what are we going to do now? We had then had to go out into the capital markets, go out and raise venture capital uh, in order to take the next steps. And, and uh, you know, that took a, a little bit of pullback, change in direction, kind of redefine our business plan a little bit and and get out there to do that. But the, the, the point being, Things don't always go the way you want them to go, uh, and 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 that was one of the big ones. Uh, moving towards Sony, then we spent a great deal of, of time and money trying to move toward a, a research instrument opportunity. Uh, yeah, so, we, so sorry, let me stop yeah. you right there. So how? So okay, so this was a big, major, disappointing event, but you, there, there clearly was opportunity there. So how, how was structuring the company like? How was it to chase down VCs? How did you end up financing this interim period between this Monsanto backing out and then leading up to the Sony? Like, how, how did you kind of keep the company afloat? What was the strategy there? How does well, one do that in such a yeah? I mean, I. I mean, uh, you know, I had some backup plans, and so I had some some um, some modest capital. That's one reason we kind of had the half million or so brought into the company and so forth. Um, we just had to get very active in in going out and and talking to people. Fortunately, at our university, there was a a, a venture capital company associated with the university, Illinois Ventures, that helped make a number of, of introductions for us. 
Uh, the venture capital climate then was a lot different than it, it became later. Uh, that it was we're kind of on the early edge of these of the technology boom. Um, but it was a lot of road trips at that time, a, a lot of a lot of phone calls. Uh, I had a business partner uh, who who was helping with us, and he and I uh, just did lots of visits, talked to a lot of people, and and he tracked down. Uh, the right investors, uh, some private investors, and and a couple of venture capital companies that that we were able to get on board. But you know anybody that's going out to raise venture, uh, you know the the thing you learn really quick is get used to rejection. Uh, it, it's uh, you know 99% of the time they're going to say no after you put a tremendous amount of effort in. You go through a couple of rounds and 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 you get what you hope is the finish line when they say, well, we've decided you're not quite a fit. And, and the one thing I would say from that is when you, you find out you're not a fit, try to find out why, because you just keep refining your pitch, you keep refining the direction until you can, can really find a sweet spot and it will happen. If there, there's plenty of money out there. And so it's just a matter of, of, of finding the right money that has the interest in the thing you're looking for and it'll hit, but you just have to ignore the rejections. Um. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good point. Do you think do you think you raised enough capital? If you could go back during that time, would you have tried to raise more capital initially with Monsanto, or would you have gone to SBIR grants? Yeah, that, that's a, a good question, and I I think probably we could have have been successful in SBIR more than we were. We we put in some applications and 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 uh, were modestly successful there. Uh, but you're correct. As, as we made our plan for uh, developing the, the instrument, if I look back to, to the work that we were doing, I think the, 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 the two biggest mistakes that I made, because I'd never done this before at that time, uh, the two biggest mistakes I made is one, I needed to get somebody involved in the company that had done it before. Uh, pretty much what I was trying to do before, not just kind of done anything before, but you needed somebody to say that I've tried to do a very complex, this is one of the most complex devices in the world you can try to make. Somebody tried to do a very complex device, bring it to market and, and that. And, and I, I didn't really have that. I had my experience from Coulter, but that was different. So um, my advice would be go find an investor, go find an advisor, bring them onto your board, get somebody mm -hmm. kind of intimately involved with you that's done it before, because they're going to tell you when you're screwing up. And, and I could have used that. I could have used somebody really tell me I'm screwing up a lot earlier than when, by the time I found out I was screwing up. And the, the, the next thing then was, was the money. I mean, I looked at how much it was going to take. And now, you know, I've, I've started a lot more companies since then. I advise companies all the time. Now I look at them, and I'll, I'll see this all the time. I said, you guys need twice the capital that you're going after to do the thing you're doing. And, and that was where I was. Uh, I, I looked back at it and, and really we were doing this for the first time among my business partner and I, we needed more capital. We, we needed to have a little bit longer runway to get us where we needed to go uh, with, with the technology, with the product introduction and things like that. And, and uh, if I had it to do over again, that, that's what I would, I would, so we needed to be more patient early, stay small, raise more capital, and then, then break out with the plan later. Uh, and you know you don't get a chance to do it over again, but but that would be uh, be what I'd say is figure out how much capital you need and then line up at least fifty percent more or maybe one hundred percent more uh, that that you know you can bring in. Um, I have two quick two questions popped up. One's from John Nolan, the other is from uh, Takiaki. Uh, for John Nolan's question is, you know, what has been your experience uh, with SBIR grants? And then for Takiaki's question, like SBIR. There are many different types of support available for early companies, but what did you find maybe the most helpful? So I guess the balance between yeah. SBIR and, and non SBIR. Well, SBIR is really useful um, when you have an early, very high risk technology. For, for, for eyesight's development, SBIR probably wasn't quite the right thing then. Uh, we did apply for a few, but never, never were able to to make it into phase two with that. Now I've done some other companies since then with SBIR. I've done a helped a um, uh, a new otoscope company that has an optical coherence uh, tomography based otoscope and and you know they've done I think close to four million dollars of SBIR funding as they've moved through and it's made an enormous difference in in, in leveraging non-dilutive funding to grow the company but but when it it, it comes to significant non-dilutive funding uh, there's a, there's a couple things I mean there's the SBIR if you happen to be working in an area that that some other large foundation or something's interested in you can go for money there 
but also there's there's a lot of often a lot of interest with various companies in doing co-development activities where a company wants to de-risk a technology or, or move forward in an area and you have a specialty and and they're interested in participating in co-development where they may not uh, need be taking equity in the company but they're going to provide cash for some deliverable and as we did with Monsanto if you can work out a favorable IP sharing situation uh, that can be uh, can very very lucrative and very helpful for companies. And I I see this being applied quite often in device type. You know, if you're trying to make a uh, an image based instrument or or a cell sort or flow cytometer, something that that is is a significant cost that would have some benefit to uh, say a large biopharma, large biotech, uh, or something like that. Then then the co-development activity I found to be very helpful, very useful. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, switch to the Sony side of the story, I just have one more question for you. So what, what lessons have you learned about IP protection and licensing that you wish you knew earlier? Uh, this point in time? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, about, about IP protection, you know, the, the, the thing about patents is that they're very important because they are very much the change on what you're going to sell your company in the future. So, so file patents early and often. Um, the, I, I, it's, um, I, I'd say, in, and, and, and if you're doing patents, hire really good people to write the claims. Um, the, the, it's one of these things that spending money on patents is, is a good thing. Usually at the end, if you ask somebody that sold their company and they're, they're usually not gonna tell you, gee, I wish I wouldn't have spent so much money on those patents. Uh, it's, it's gonna be the other way around, but if you're gonna spend money on patents, don't go online and just type your own ideas in and you know, find, find some really good counsel, find the best counsel you can to write the claims so that you really have solid intellectual property going forward. But when, when they're gonna value your company, when they're looking at buying in your company, they're gonna look at that intellectual property portfolio. And that's the, if you wanna call it the excuse or the reason, or that's what they're gonna spend money and justify this, especially if it's a public company. They're going to justify a uh, purchase heavily, uh, largely on, on on the intellectual property portfolio. So, um, so yeah, and and for me, I used to think all kinds of things. Oh, nobody's going to think that's a good patent. And I just found out now. Go ahead and apply. Uh, get a lot of stuff out there, and and hire good attorneys to to get good good claims. Um, I don't know. I, I think I've got, I don't know, three dozen or something patents out there now. And, and uh, th those were very, very helpful uh, as we move the company forward. Not so much uh, to avoid competition with the other companies. Again, if you're, you're building a company to sell or to exit in the future as, as the equity on which people are going to spend their money to buy you. So that, that's kind of what I'd say that plan for that. And it takes a while to get a, a good IP portfolio together. Thanks for that. Um, so, so now iSight um, is not with Monsanto anymore, and it's its own individual company. So, what happened? You know, well, so many so, the picture. Right? So, so how, what happened? <laughs> we, we were we were working very hard and had a, had a plan for where we wanted to really take the technology and the company and all these things, and and uh, we're racing along really well in 2008. Um, and in fact, we were very successful in the shared instrument, uh, NIH shared instrument funding rounds that came up that were instruments that were going to be placed in 2009. And um, then lo and behold, uh, what happened is that big stock market crash uh, that happened in the fall of, uh, so you, next, next disappointment, <laughs> uh, because while we thought we had all of our manufacturing capacity uh, uh, locked in pretty much for 2009, and, and we, we were able then to have a very large technology development effort that we were planning associated with that that was gonna achieve a lot of the goals that I had. Uh, the stock market crash had, and from a period of about six weeks, we went from uh, having a, a significant position of, of orders to having nothing because the universities were all looking at their, uh, their, uh, you know, their, their portfolios, uh, looking at their endowments, and the NIH would allow you to hold money over for a year. And so everybody decided, even though they won these grants, they were going to hold the money for another year before they spent it. Uh, and even the people that we were doing business with at the time uh, didn't really want to pay because, again, it, it, that was a, a major event. And so for a small business in, in the capital equipment business, uh, having the bottom fall out of the market was, was, uh, was pretty devastating to us, uh, really, as far as uh, how are we going to operate this business, how are we going to go forward? Uh, because, it, and, and at that time, 
uh, you, you know, what do you do? I mean, you can't go to your investors because they're all their stock portfolios just went down, you know, this enormous amount as well. Nobody's ready to write a check. So, um, so it was a tough period, tough time. And it was really a, a, at that time that we pivoted a little bit away from saying our product is the focus to our technology is the focus and began, as I talked a little bit about before, about seeking uh, co-development partner opportunities uh, in order to, uh, to continue to fund the company and to help carry, uh, you know, to, to weather the storm of, of the, the bottom fell out of the market then. And so that's kind of another, again, to the entrepreneur, there's things you can control and there's things you can't control. You can't control the fact the bottom falls out of the market like that. I can't control decisions that are made by the board of directors of some giant company that I'm a peon down here too and so forth. So, you know, you just have to kind of take, take it and roll with it as you go. And, and as you go along in, in, the, in the path, more than one of those things is likely going to happen. You know, you make good plans, but then you have to deal with what really happens. So, so then how did uh, I, I start getting approached by Sonic? Who yeah, approached well, first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, of course, I guess Yamoto-san will be, uh, be talking soon. I think many of the, the folks on here would know Yamoto-san from, from the meetings, but um, uh, Yamoto-san and I met at about that time and uh, he can tell the story better than I, but he was in the United States to help with the, uh, the launch of Blu-ray technology, which he was very much the inventor and founder and leader of for Sony. And he somehow ended up in Paul Robinson's lab, and 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 I, you know, something to do with, and he, you'll have to have him explain this later, but something to do with using confocal microscopes in Paul's lab to look at the injected molded discs and things. And he and Paul got talking about cell sorters, and Paul didn't know all the engineering answers Yamamoto-san wanted to have answered. And so uh, he just called up and said, can I come over and see you, Gary? And so he and I had a dinner uh, together over in Champaign. And, uh, and that was the start then of a, of a, of a long relationship, a fantastic uh, friendship with, with Yamoto-san and, and also opportunity then for both Sony and EyeSight, uh, which ultimately led to Sony you know, entering, entering the marketplace. Now, again, to add to the... That, that always something goes wrong. Uh, the night that Yamoto-san's coming over, we're planning dinner. My youngest son totaled his car uh, that evening, uh, right before I was supposed to go over there. And so we were dealing that night with another, fortunately nobody injured or anything, but you know, things just always go wrong. And I'll always remember looking at that totaled car. Uh, but that, that, was, that was how we first interacted with somewhat serendipitously at that time. Uh, and uh, began talking flow cytometry and cell sorting and Sony's interests and, and uh, began to work on some projects together with them and planning together with them. And uh, over uh, you know, a couple of year period, uh, developed relationship, trust uh, on, on both parties. I spent a lot of time in Japan. Uh, Yamoto-san and his team spent a lot of time in the US. Uh, and then ultimately that, that uh, culminated with uh, Sony acquiring the company uh, and and moving it it forward as a subsidiary company of the of the of the Sony Corporation, and uh, and so that was a, a, a I think a very certainly a, a, a life changing event for me uh, with that happening, and, and I'm still very appreciative of Sony and Yamato-san and all things that happened with that. But I also think that I, I I'm I'm happy that 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 brought Sony into the the flow cytometry market and into the life science industry. I I think that was. A, I think it was good. I think it was good for, for what we're doing now and in innovation. I think it's good for the future of the, uh, of, and I don't want to be you know, too strange about this, but kind of future of the world, when you have these very large consumer product companies uh, becoming involved in these areas, mm -hmm. uh, they can rapidly change uh, advancement of technology because the resources that they have available to them. So, so at the at this time when when you you went from that all these different hurdles and now you're collaborate now you're in this early stage of collaborating with Sony you know how how big was Eyesight how many engineers did you have staffed um, and and as someone had just asked um, were there any dis disagreements among your team during the hard times or you know how did you overcome that with the team Oh yeah I mean there were. There, there certainly were, were were disagreements as as we went went through this. There were disagreements at, at the level of uh, how do how do we decide about strategy and what we're going to do. 
Uh, certainly, uh, I, you know, I had to lay off half of my company uh, after the uh, after the stock market crash. So we had scaled up, planning this big technology push, almost a complete new generation kind of of, of the technology that, that we were expecting to do. And then the stock market crash happened and the orders all went away. And, and that meant that jobs went away for a lot of people and some people that I, you know, it was very hard for me to have to deliver that uh, to them. Uh, and so we, we cut our workforce by about 50% uh, at that time. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, you say it's a disagreement, but I mean, for those people that were laid off, it was a very, very hard, I'm not complaining myself as much as the people who lost their jobs. That was a very, very hard situation uh, to have to encounter at that time and really, really gut wrenching as a, as a, as an owner and, 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 and executive at the company to have to deliver that message to the people and then rally the company around. Okay. Now, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to move forward from there? Um, I'd have to say the boardroom uh, we had, and, and I'd, I'd say if, if you have a startup company and, and assemble your board and use your board, one of the most important things you can do with your board is be absolutely honest with them. Don't ever hide anything. Don't, don't ever make, you know, don't do anything like that and use your board to really solve these very difficult problems. Uh, and I'd say that our, our board meetings during that time were, were difficult. Um, there, there weren't good solutions. No solution was thought to be a good solution sometimes. So, um, so that's it. Well, thank, thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Betsy. She wants to know, how did you solve the healthcare insurance issue and keep key personnel during the hard times? Well, I, that it's, it is interesting. The healthcare insurance, I mean, we, we went out of the market and found it, um, it was just uh, one of the things I did is I went out and I, I hired somebody in the company that had some experience in business management who handled a number of those things. Um, but that was part of what we raised the extra capital to make sure we could fund. Uh, and so so we, we handled that well. Um, and then the, what was the second thing you asked? You asked um, all about- How did you keep your key personnel or I guess, and how did you identify them? I guess, well, you probably knew who your key personnel was early on. Yeah, right? uh, well, that, that's a good question. Um, I didn't, in fact, I, in some cases I couldn't keep all my key personnel uh, because I couldn't afford to, um, frankly. Uh, you're honest with them. You're straightforward with them. Uh, it, it was less of a problem with the big economic downturn because that was not a good time to go out and look for another job. Uh, but you try to be honest with them. You try to find ways to uh, to manage the compensation issue. Uh, we certainly put out there, and and and, and in, in some cases, uh, people took some reductions and so forth uh, during a period uh, in, in exchange for stock options and so forth to to manage through some of those periods. Um, that, that were kind of difficult financially. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, uh, you know, the, but that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's kind of normal. Um, but, but, you know, it, it's difficult. And a few of the key people did move on, decide, well, I, I, I need to, I, I can't afford to do this, or we're gonna move out of state now and in response to this, because they've got their lives, they've got, uh, they've got to deal with those things as well uh, during the challenges. Thanks, uh, by, thank you for that. Uh, by the time, um, uh, eyesight was acquired by Sony. Uh, so by, by that time, um, what, what had you learned as an entrepreneur that, that you, you were kind of like sort of lessons or, or kind of rules of thumb that you could tell other entrepreneurs? Yeah. Because yeah, that was I, a big success point for you and, and for Sony and, and for, for the community at that point. So kind of what, you know, what could you share? Well, one, uh, of course, I'd, I'd, I'd made a lot of mistakes. Um, don't, don't, you can't get hung up on the mistakes you make. I mean, you can't go back and redo things. There's a lot of decisions I wish I'd have gone back, but you just have to move on um, from those things. But I think I mentioned one, uh, I, I just, I can't overstate the importance of trying to get someone involved with you that's done it before. They don't necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be an employee, but investor, board member, close advisor, paid advice, somebody in, in that, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I learned uh, a very, very hard lesson that in this, and and I, I had uh, some meetings where I took key opinion leaders in and and sat and talked about where we were with the technology and so forth, 
and and um, and I didn't listen closely enough to to their really honest device and a, advice. And I was kind of pushed by the business people. You got to move faster. You got to move. You know, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and put some things into the market and whatnot. And as I look back, that that was a, a mistake. Uh, you, you you only know if you got a product when your customers tell you do. Uh, tell you that you have one. The way to find out, not that you look at a product and say, boy, I'm really proud of that thing. I love what it is. And all the engineers look at it and say, hey, this thing's great. What you have to have is you have to have it in customers' hands and they have to tell you it's great. And 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 so anytime now, if, if I ever do it over again or I advise anybody and they're trying to come up with the first product and say, get it out there, get it in people's hands and then shut up and let them tell you what they think of it. And be ready for the fact that you may have to go back and, and do some serious things to it again. And, um, you know, that those aren't hard things to hear when you're in that position, when you've labored so hard to get to a point. But it's very important to have very objective ways to evaluate whether a product is really ready to go to market, because once you go to market, it is just almost impossible to make changes and to update. It's so expensive to do. So really, that transition of from R&D and to go to market, uh, having a really objective plan for making decisions around that point. Uh, and so that you're, you're certain, you know, what you're doing at that point, uh, would be really important. Yeah. So, uh, two, two questions kind of related, uh, one is regarding beta sites. So I guess if you're doing like a key opinion leader launch, um, how many would you try or recommend trying if you, if you had tried it at the time? And then, um, Kathy's asked, you know, get it out there, but, but to whom is it really a prototype? Are you selling it? So I guess this is raising the topic of a successful yeah, I, opinion leader launch on a beta. Yeah, I, I'd say the first step is get it out there. No, they're not, you're not selling it. Uh, uh, get it out there and, and get, get people to really use it and, and get feedback on now. It depends on the product we were building. We, we, we were crazy to do what we did <laughs> with the size team and the amount of money. As I look back on it, I mean, we just built this monstrosity of a machine and, um, and it was really hard. And we did some, some highly, highly, we got all the really high tech stuff, right. And then a lot of things, some of the things that weren't so high tech, we didn't quite get right. And, and that was, you know, looking back disappointing. Uh, but yeah, I'd say you 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 want to you want to you know go out there and 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 uh, first of all, before you even made the thing, you've made contact with people who have a need for it. So I mean, why are you making it if there's not a need for it? Now we'd kind of done that, and I had a good set of advisors. I had people I could have gone to with more uh, more machines for more time that we were connected with, um, and that's what my advice would be: is get 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 real users involved of whatever your product is early on. Try to get their feedback. If if it's a software product or something, get minimum you get MVPs in their hands, so you get good feedback on that. If it's a device product, you got to get it working well enough they could really use it to give you real feedback on it. Uh, but plan for that and plan for the money and the time necessary to take that feedback and do the necessary design revision, revisions to get it right. Uh, would be my my advice. Yeah, it's, it sounds like in a way it's it's easy to invent something that nobody needs, but it's a lot harder to invent something that somebody needs. Yeah, and and execution is just damn hard. <laughs> it, it is really you know, it looks it always looks really simple from the outside, probably, but getting all the details right and executing and getting something actually finished. I don't care how complex the product is, finishing a product is really hard, and it's hard hard work. Uh, I'm and sure, you have to really uh, committed to it. I'm sure Sony taught you a thing or two about how to execute and deliver on time. Oh my gosh! They, you know, they they pump out so many so many products and and they do such a good job at it. What what was something you learned from them that you were able to apply for your future endeavors post eyesight? Well, so Sony was just excellent at at planning a project from start to finish, and so I really learned a lot about about how to really organize and in detail plan a project from start to finish. Um, now, of course, Sony had overwhelming force they could bring to bear on things. And so they just had this unlimited bench of engineers. They would say, oh, we need a great optical engineer. Oh, we got, we got 10 of them. So we need this, you know, we need this electrical. Oh, we got a half a dozen people over here we can bring in. So, so you don't always have something like that available to you, but, but they were uh, very effective at, at uh, making plans, uh, uh, working through on timelines and, and, and just execution. And they're, they're enormously effective at quality. 
in ways that that I I doubt if I would ever be able to to match. But their ability to transition a product into manufacturing and manufacture an an extremely high quality product, they had the mechanisms and systems to do that. And I learned a tremendous amount about that. And and again, in all the startups that that I've done since then and worked with since then. We've had a real focus on on paying attention to that manufacturing transition, and and the proper uh, uh, quality approach to ensure that, that 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 you're delivering the highest possible quality product to the customer. Thanks. Um, so we have 15 minutes left. Uh, John wants to know what um, you're doing now, uh, which I guess we could both share. Uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And Betsy has asked, um, what were the main things that you learned to integrate into your future plans? Yeah, um, well, I'll call it Betsy's question last. Again, don't, don't take yourself or things too seriously. Um, life is very chaotic and, and we just have to deal with the chaos as we go through. Uh, and, uh, and the most important things, which is not surprising, and we all kind of know this, but in reality, uh, are, are the people and the family. If I look back at, at EyeSight uh, and, and the cytometry services and the companies that I'd, I'd done there uh, and at, at that time, the thing I'm, I'm most satisfied about are all the people who's, who gained employment through them. Uh, the you know kids that made their went, got their college educations because their their parents were working for the company, uh, the successes of those people, uh, a number of the students that came through as interns that have gone on to be very successful in in business or in their careers, uh, those are things I look back on that feel lasting to me, uh, not not the business transactions as much as the as the interactions with the people and, 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 and then my own family as well. My, my oldest son, electrical engineer, I was very pleased that he was able to work in the company for a while. And, uh, and, and those things are things that you can't replace those kinds of experiences. So, so, um, so that's what I would recommend is, you know, going forward, keep your eye on the ball as far as the business, but we work to live. Uh, we don't live to work. And so, so uh, keep your focus on the things in life that really matter. Um, as far as what I'm doing, well, I'm, I'm, I'm back in the BS. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Oh, before, yeah. before, you, before you get to there, I want to, I want to leave the, like, um, please anyone, um, you know, if there's anyone else that'd like to ask a question before, before we hear what Gary, um, is up to now, um, please, please ask, um, this is, uh, this is a good use of, uh, the time to ask any questions. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. So we have another question. So, um, so what do you think were the company's most effective accomplishments in gaining access to the acquisition opportunity? So I guess this is a reference to the, the Sony acquisition. Yeah. We may, we, why, why was Sony interested in this maybe as, a, as, as part of our, what, what, what was, did that? I guess, yeah, I guess what did EyeSight uh, uh, accomplish that was effective in, in gaining access? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, we had we had a lot of technology that was working very, very well, uh, and and well, Lou McCallan was was a part of the company at that time, and 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 myself were were providing significant leadership there. We had a lot, a very good understanding of the flow cytometry marketplace and the business opportunity. Uh, we we had a we had a a roadmap for and, and you've seen some of that roadmap being executed with the machines Sony's brought to market. Uh, we had a roadmap of, of what we believed you need, we needed to be doing as far as benchtop cell sorting uh, and, and sterile cell, cell, cell sorting, cell, cell sorting technologies could be applied to, to therapeutics. Uh, we, we, we had this roadmap and, and we, under, we, we believed we understood where the market would be going and where the opportunities were in the context of knowing that Beckman Dickinson is going to remain doing what they're doing. Uh, uh, Beckman Coulter would remain doing what they're doing, but we believe there was a, a significant path of opportunity. And so I think that, that both the technology and, and also uh, explaining and, and presenting what our roadmap was to, to the future, along with our intellectual property, were, were the main things that, 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 were, that contributed. Uh, you know, we, had, we weren't a large player in the marketplace as far as dollars or number of, of sites. And so you know, uh, looking back on it, you had like a Curie that came out with a really cheap machine and sold a you know a gazillion of those. 
And that was a really good strategy. I thought, well, shit, I wish I'd have done that. So, uh, <laughs> you know, like it was a lot easier. But but those guys did a great job. I mean, my hat's off to them. And I watched what Gare did, Gare Vandenen, and he did with his company, with Cytopia. And so we, that's the context in which we were playing is we had places like Akuri and, and Cytopia and whatnot that were out there doing things. And so, um, um, so yeah, I, I think that, that that was really it, that we kind of knew where we wanted to go. We knew what to do. We didn't have the resources to do it, and they did. Nice. Thank you. And uh, the last question before you let us know what you're up to uh, as of present day is uh, what John Daly asks, what was your favorite Saito? That's a really good question. I really enjoyed like Placid. Of course, I went to all all the tons of them there in Colorado Springs, and kind of they blend together that the honeybee there with the yards of beer and everything. That kind of maybe the yards of beer is why they kind of all blend together. But um, but the 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 ones that stand out in my mind are Bergen and Lake Placid. So uh, uh, I, I I those for some reason. Uh, are the ones that I remember the most. Uh, Bergen, Norway was one I, I remember a lot. Uh, and uh, for, for a few events there, I mean, Bergen, Norway, you couldn't find a good place to drink. So Coulter did this giant, this suite where it was like unlimited and kind of seemed like everybody was there. So it was a huge party there. Uh, but then I had some some just great interactions uh, with, with good friends in, in cytometry uh, during that Bergen, Norway uh, meeting. I was part, part of Paul's lab at that time for that meeting. And then Lake Placid, um, really enjoyed that. Um, um, I remember, uh, you know, Gare Vandenen, he and I had a number of discussions there and, and a lot of things going on. It was a very, um, uh, it was a meeting that I, I, I came away with a lot of ideas, a lot of excitement. And, and so Lake Placid was, was a big one for me too. So yeah. those are the two that stand out in my mind. And of course, everybody's saying, well, guys, that was eons ago and, and you're right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it was a long time ago, but they were formative in, in, in my career for sure, those meetings. I, I want to say that about ISAC. ISAC was formative in my career. I mean, I began attending ISAC meetings uh, back in, in 1980. That was, that was one of the Lake Placid meetings then. Uh, and and it, was, it was very important to me. And I always appreciated how... Uh, the uh, you know Scott Cram, Jim Jett, the the kind of the the leaders in in the community at that time, Howard, would take time to to talk to people like me at those meetings. It it meant a lot uh, going forward. So, um, what are you up to nowadays? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I after after Sony and whatnot, I did some different things. Uh, we started, a, a, I've helped start a number of different companies. I've been a venture investor and 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 whatnot. I mentioned the Otoscope company. I did a an a, a porcine vaccine company. Uh, 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 another uh, a, a, a company that's focused on diagnosis, uh, prediction of diagnosis for sepsis, uh, with with another uh, Bobby Reddy, another another great entrepreneur. But then, then I, I helped a healthcare company start a, a virtual reality education company called Health Scholars. Uh, that company's still running out in, in, in now in uh, Denver. Uh, we founded that and I was CEO of that for a while as we grew it. And now I've got somebody as a CEO out there. They recently closed on about $17 million of funding and they're making fantastic virtual reality uh, uh, for, uh, for education of doctors and nurses. And then uh, I've, I've and, and during all this time, I've kind of had my engineering company, Techmel, which uh, is a job shop, makes all kinds of gadgetries and, and, and things like that. It's been making uh, COVID-19 robotics for COVID-19 diagnostic labs. Uh, we have, have several of those robots out there now. But I'm personally now back in the bull semen sorting business. And so I'm employed by Cytonome. Uh, and uh, which is, is headquartered in Bedford, uh, Boston. I still live in Champaign-Urbana. And then uh, the, they, they are the supplier of all the equipment for uh, STGen, which is the largest supplier of, of bull semen that's sorted for uh, gender uh, for the, uh, the bovine, uh, dairy bovine business. And so I'm um, kind of a, a you know, technical advisor. They call me an engineering fellow. That's what they call you when you're old. And so I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm here doing that now for, uh, for those guys. Yeah. And we enjoy having you. With us. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so we technically have about 10 minutes left. So I think if anyone has any other questions or if there's any other things we'd want to cover, 
Um, I think we can be a good use of the time. Or if, if John, John Nolan, if you want to jump in and, and, and remind everyone they can ask well, questions. And... I, I have another little story I can tell if you want me to, but I don't have to. Sure, sure absolutely. Well, I don't know if you, it just depends, but I mean, I, 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 old people have filler stories. And so I can tell <laughs> a filler story here. But um, how do you know if you've got a really elegant idea? Um, and I believe, by the way, I believe that there are super elegant things out there to still invent. And, and I go back and I was very, very fortunate to have spent a, a limited amount of time with Wallace Coulter when I joined that company. He was very interested in what we we're doing in flow cytometry. But my definition of an elegant idea is, is something like you look at the Coulter principle. And, and it, you know, it, it, it's the little hole and it's an electrode on the outside and the inside and the cells flow. You can explain the whole thing to somebody in, in like five minutes or less, yet it changed the world. It literally changed the world. It developed a multi-billion dollar industry of, of automated hematology from just figuring out you know, I can do this. When you ask Wallace, well, how, how did you make this thing? I mean, he used a glass tube. He said he took the cellophane off from a cigarette, you know, that used to be wrapped around cigarette packs, probably not too many smokers on the call here, poked a hole in it with a needle, put a rubber band around it to, to make an orifice for the end of the tube and tried it out. Uh, that's your minimum viable prototype right there. So people think, well, hey, we just invented MVP and lean, right? Oh, look at that. Right? This is late 1940s. So um, the, the point is this kind of entrepreneurship has been going on in the cytometry for a long time. And I never developed a as, as elegant as an idea as that in my career, but I think they're out there and I'm still in the hunt even at my age. So I just encourage everybody on the call to stay in the hunt because that kind of elegance is still out there and we still are gonna be able to change the world with the things we do. The things we do as entrepreneurs in this field of cytometry and diagnostics and therapeutics, we change the world. People are gonna be alive because of things that we've done. People are gonna live longer because of things we've done. Uh, don't discount that. Uh, this is a worthwhile thing to be doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I've, I've been happy to have been involved in this field. I started out getting an opportunity to know one of the greatest entrepreneurs, in my opinion, in cytometry, Wallace Coulter, and and uh, appreciate ISAC, what ISAC's been doing. But I say for anybody that's interested in entrepreneurship on the call or inventing things in, in this field, go for it, make yeah. it happen. And so and so with that, you know, what what can ISAC do to promote innovation in the sector? Put people together. You know, expose people to to one another. Give and you know, in this time of COVID, it's tough. But yeah, uh, to provide information, provide opportunity for uh, to to uh, to help people move forward and understand the details of it. I don't want people getting hung up on the mechanics of how to develop. They, they it's really taking the ideas and, and running with the great ideas. Um, we do have a we have a, we have a sneaking question from Betsy. She wants to know what is the hardest skill set to recruit. <sighs> I guess that's you're not you're not going to like this, right? Uh, regulatory compliance, I would say, is the hardest skill set to recruit. Well, uh, the, and they and they can make or break your company because you get somebody that's just like crazy and and they they mess it all up. Uh, but but you know you can you can recruit really good technical people. The second thing that's hard to recruit is a really good business person, and I never have been that. Um, and, and recruiting the really, really good business people, people that, 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 that know how to get the, the, the wheels aligned so that everything just works. Um, they're, they're just so valuable and they're just hard to find. But I'll say the hardest thing I ever had to recruit was the right kind of regulatory compliance person uh, to really fit in, into uh, into an organization they, that, that just I spent more money trying to find the right people there than than any place else. Wow. Thanks. Um, and then uh, we have a question from Takiyaki. If if you could go back to your early day of entre being an entrepreneur, you know what would you change? I think you've touched on some of this, but I guess if there was one thing you could only choose one thing you could change, what could it have been? change one thing. Um, I would have listened better to my 
to my to the to my users, my early my early advisors, customers, and users. I, I needed to be on a better listener to them. And so, if there was one thing I think could have changed things that I, I think that I would have been happier with with outcomes, um, I, I would have been I would have paid more attention and and listened better uh, to the the people who I, I was trying to gain I, I was trying to gain advice, but I have to say I wasn't listening as well. And so um, I, I'd say I would have listened to the, and I would have sought out more of it. I would have sought out more advisors who knew about the field, knew about how to do these kinds of things. I would have spent a lot more time uh, with them than I did, because I, I could have learned a lot more from their experiences and their advice than what I, I did. Their advice, it's kind of like when you're a kid, you're you know, your, your dad is stupid until you get to be about 25 or 30 and then yes. you start realizing how smart he was. <laughs> and that's kind of how it is when you go through all this, you kind of look back. And I think those guys were trying to tell me something and I missed <laughs> it. And so I'd say I'd listen better. Uh, that would have been a big difference. Cool. Well, um, well, thank you for, for, for all of this. This was, this was wonderful. Um, I, I, I personally really enjoyed this uh, and I hope our, our audience did. Um, we have about four minutes left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over uh, to John. But I just want to really thank everyone um, that, that, that joined. Um, this is being recorded, and I think John's going to talk about um, where, this, where this recording will go. Um, I do apologize for the clunkiness of, of timing regarding Zoom invites and, and asking people to join a separate app. In this case, it was Slack to also field questions. Um, we're trying to figure out the best way to sort of keep this as an archive as well, uh, the Zoom group chat. Uh, disappears once this calls over. So we're just trying to find a better way to do it. And I think um, this is a fantastic start and it's only gonna get even better, but but this was amazing. So just just thank you everyone. And, and, and thank you, Gary, so much for uh, yeah. doing this. I really appreciate it. This yeah, was, this no, was a lot of fun. Thank you guys. And everybody have a great time. Stay safe, uh, wait for the vaccination, get her done. Yep, so it was great. It was exactly what we wanted. Um, we'll be sharing details about how to access the recording. We're going to try to do this uh, once a month or so. Um, we're doing it on a shoestring. So if anyone has any constructive suggestions about how to do it better or smoother, we're, we're all ears. Um, so with that, I'll thank Gary and Kirk and hope to see everyone online sometime in the next month or so. Have a good, have a good day, everyone.